Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the conference Strengthening Partnerships and Innovation in Mediterranean Non-Wood Forest Products Value Chains. This conference constitutes the final conference of the project Incredible. My name is Steven Liebrecht, and I will be your facilitator for this conference. The hosting organization for this conference is ESA, which is the School of Agriculture of Lisbon. So let me introduce you to Margarida Tome. She will be the host, your host basically for this event, and she's a professor at ESA. Margarida, please. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to open the final conference of the, of the incredible uh, project. As you all know, the incredible project is about non-wood forest products. And I think that we are all committed to the transition between an oil-based economy to a bio-based economy. Uh, we all want a green economy for Europe. But this vision depends strongly on the rural areas and on the rural population. And so we want to have a healthy and quality life for the rural populations. Non-wood forest products can be an important contribution to the rural economies and therefore to the conservation and management of the important uh, ecosystems in which the green economy will be based. That's why incredible project uh, is so important. The main objective of the incredible project uh, was to link knowledge to action with a strong emphasis on innovation. This was made around five uh, thematic networks, the so-called INETs or innovation networks. Each one of them was based on a non-wood forest product or a group of non-wood forest products, namely cork, aromatics, resin, uh, mushroom and truffles, and berries and nuts. Each one of these INETs joined all actors along the value chain and we all worked together during the last three years towards the valorization of our uh, non-wood forest product. Uh, we made it through the share of knowledge, the development of innovative business models, uh, the enhancements of expertise. Today, we want to share some of our achievements with you. I hope that you will enjoy what we have prepared for you. Thank you so much, Margarita. Well, apart from Margarita, who will be the host of this uh, event, let me also introduce another person that has been a very critical person to this project. His name is Inazio Martinez de Arano. He is the director of the, Europe, of the Mediterranean facility of the European Forest Institute, and he's, he has been the coordinator of this project incredible. Inazio, please. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Margarita. It's really a great pleasure to be here with you all, uh, celebrating uh, okay. this incredible final conference. Uh, every time a project ends, it's like a mixed feelings. Uh, for one, we are happy uh, for the work done. And in this case, we have done a lot of work. And, and, and there are uh, several things that we can really be proud about. It's also sadness because we want to continue working together and, and the opportunity of work, of working in an international context, in a Mediterranean context, on non forest products is really, is really a great opportunity and a pleasure. So we're also sad, but above all, we, we feel the positive energy uh, to continue looking for new opportunities and advancing in this topic together. So we wanted this conference to be not, not inward looking, uh, but just celebrating uh, and sharing the, the, the highlights and, and the best success we have achieved, especially forward looking uh, uh, for future actions for continuing and, and also for engaging maybe persons that have not been involved in our networks, but that they are coming out to, to our incredible projects, also to give them also the positive energy and to serve together, uh, as I said, future opportunities. But maybe before we move a little bit on this, I wanted to, to give, especially for those that are outside our, our, our internal networks, a bit of context on the incredible project. This is a thematic network. Uh, it's an instrument of European Commission to foster a rural innovation that was launched with Horizon 2020. So a specific type of project, not to research, but to share knowledge and to promote innovation in, rela in relation to the core 
critical challenges of, of European agriculture and rural areas. So we took this opportunity to work on, on, on Ungo Forest products because we believe in the enormous potential to address our, our current challenges. And looking at the Mediterranean Basin, as Margarita was saying, the way we manage our natural resources in the context of climate change, the way we make the best of them to advance in this uh, green and bio-based economy, uh, and the necessity to generate quality jobs and employment also in rural areas are critical elements. So around those challenges, we identify a for this product as a, as a critical element, and, and we've been working these three years to understand where are the opportunities for innovation and, and, and to mobilize knowledge from practice and from science to, to help innovation. And for this, we've been working, we've done over 20 major workshops in these networks, five cross-cutting seminars on different, uh, three cross-cutting topics. We have done ton, dozens of, of one-day events. We launched innovation, open innovation challenges. We launched open an open uh, knowledge context to how to better translate knowledge in, into practice. We collected 250 fact sheets with examples and, and pieces of information that are useful for innovators to apply it. Uh, and during, during all this process, we've been collecting also uh, recommendations for action in policy, which we compiled in a, in a white paper that was discussed in a policy forum. So it's been around moving ideas in different setups, in different themes, cross-cutting themes, particular specific things in the field, and lately a lot, a lot online. So, the, the, so what we'll see today is, is the result of, of, of all this amazing piece of work when you look backwards. Um, but, but as I said, we didn't want to, this conference to be looking inward, we wanted to, to be looking forward. So this is a festival of innovation. So we start with a festival of, of, of policy recommendations uh, to innovate. We will see our winners of our contest challenge, our best innovations, the flagship initiatives we've been developing. Uh, and, and at the end, we will reflect together on, on this instrument, the thematic network, how to really make innovation happen in the Mediterranean region. Uh, so, well, so just to give you this, this positive idea that this is not the end of a project, this is the start of, of future endeavors together. Thank you. Excellent, Inacio. Thank you for <laughs> these wonderful introductions by both of you. I think this really helps pretty much in, in framing this, this conference, right? So let me now show a couple of introductory slides to just explain the agenda, how we are going to uh, together work during this uh, conference. I will be doing this some share screening effort. If everything is okay, you should be now looking at my presentation. Okay, so here we are. So, well, let's, let's first ask ourselves the question, why are we here? Inacio already stipulated that this, this basically, this conference marks the end of a three-year project, and we wanted to celebrate this. It's a culmination of three-year-long effort based on intense collaboration, obviously within the project consortium, also within this innovation networks that both Margarita and Inacio refer to, the Non-Good Forest Product Innovation Networks, but also collaboration with lots of stakeholders inside and outside uh, the project consortium. Now, we would like to explore some of the outcomes, basically by presenting flagship initiatives, achievements that we have realized uh, in each of these innovation networks, and also innovations that originated from the project during this collaboration, during this intense collaboration. Now, by the way we formulate this, it's already clear that we do not want to just talk about work packages, tasks, deliverables. Yes, all of these are there, but that's the official framework, if you like. We would rather than looking back, prefer to look to the future. And for us, what is important, and that makes this conference much more than just a final conference, is that we would like to highlight the importance of making non-wood forest products more visible. And throughout the project, we have been working on integrating non-wood forest products in the EU strategies. We had a policy forum for that. In integrating non-wood forest products in the EU research agenda, even yesterday, we had a workshop on this. And in integrating or better integrating non-wood forest products in thematic networks in Europe. And that's one of the objectives we have for today. Now, how are we going to realize or achieve this objective? Well, we have two days, today and tomorrow. We have three sessions. This is session one, 
which is about incredible achievements, policy recommendations, and key project outcomes. This session will last until 1.30 Central European summer time. Later in the afternoon, we have the second session, which basically, as Inats already stated, will be about celebrating the outcomes in the sense of an innovation festival. Tomorrow, we have the third session, where we put the focus squarely on non-wood forest products in EU thematic networks. Lessons learned. Now, you see there is an additional block, which is the networking block. That is an optional. It's something we offer to you attendees. If at the end of session two, so towards the end of today, if you feel like, yes, I would like to have a chat with that person or that party, or I think I'm just going to hang a little bit around, just like a virtual bar, so to speak, uh, well, you can stay with us. We will give you indications on where to go to, to just enable or basically facilitate some networking. We know that the rooms will be virtual. We know that the beer will be virtual, but the discussions can be very real. Now, this session, session one, let's see. We will first have a keynote presentation by Jenny Wong. She will deliver a speech on a presentation on people and non-wood forest products in Europe. That will be followed by a presentation on policy recommendations on non-wood forest products, delivered by Sarah Maltoni from Forestas. Then we will have a series of short presentations. I'm specifically being a bit fake because it's going to be a little bit special. So it's a series of short presentations on innovation in non-wood forest product thematic networks, highlights. And towards the end of this session, we have time for a round table and debate where we basically will be discussing non-wood forest products observatory for the Mediterranean area. What needs to happen? Why would it be a good idea? Now, so, who are we? Very quickly. Obviously, you will see some faces throughout this conference, uh, but we just want to, you to know that there are many project partners. All of them are obviously equally important because we have been working together very intensely. Here you see all the labels. Some of the people uh, that have been uh, part of the project will obviously be very visible uh, in this final conference, but there are many more people that have played a role. Okay, just to say the core team, as mentioned before, Margarita Tomei is the host, Inazio Martinez de Arano is the coordinator of the incredible project, the organizing team is Isa Efi with uh, support from CISA for an asset, uh, Zoom and broadcasting is done by Aventos, and we have CESA for, for the live tweeting communications, you see a team of reporters and having the chat, I'm mentioning those names because you will see these names appearing throughout the conference. I will talk about the chat in a minute and the facilitation. Well, that's uh, my name. You already know this. Okay, so let me give a little bit more explanation on interactivity in an online event. We all know that the rules of conferences have been changed for more than a year now, right? Still, we would like to create an interactive event. And to that extent, we have selected and designed a variety of formats. We have keynote speeches, we have shorter presentations, we have videos, we have infographics, panel debates, and even some polling. And we hope you will like what we have prepared for you. To the attendees, I would like to say, well, you are attending a broadcast event, right? So you are in a window in a browser, basically. Now, if you have questions, you can you can still post them, right? You have, if you would scroll down in your window, you will see there is underneath, there is a chat feature. So if you have questions, and we really would like to recommend you to ask to be part of this and to ask questions, but post them in the chat. We have a team of people monitoring the chat and handling the questions, okay? If you are a speaker, well, you have already been briefed, you are in a Zoom meeting, so you have different uh, features, if you like, or facilities. And if needed, you might have to check uh, a proper window uh, or to find a proper window in a few options, but you already know that. We are pretty much hoping for a very respectful debate and chat. I'm sure that this will happen. I'm also asking respect for the time is if we announce that we have to move on. It's not a sign of disrespect to the debate that is going on. It's just that we have to go through a different point because we have an agenda, right? A final reminder, this final conference is being recorded, just so you know. I think this brings me to the end of this introductions. Now, before we 
move on and introduce the first speaker, we would already like to show you a short movie. We have lots of short movies, and the first one is going to be what we call an animated infographic. And this one is going to be on aromatic and medicinal plants. And we have, for each of the innovation networks, we have such a movie. And throughout the conference, we will just every now and then show one of these. Alberto, you can show the first uh, infographic. Okay, so here we are again. Well, we have, I hope you have been introduced now to the world of aromatics and medicinal plants, but let's move on to our program and let me introduce the first speaker we have. Uh, her name is Jenny Wong and she is the director of Wild Resources Limited, based in the UK, and she will deliver a presentation on people and non wood forest products in Europe. Mrs. Wong, the floor is yours. Um, hello everybody, um, thank you very much to the um, organisers of this conference for inviting me to give the, uh, the keynote presentation. Um, it's, a, it's a great honour though, I had to spend a little time thinking about what might be um, appropriate. So I, I, what I thought I would do is I would talk a little bit about the wider context of the way in which um, NWFPs um, interact, um, their, their connections with the people of Europe. Um, and I'm going to base a lot of what I'm saying on, on the Star Tree Household Survey, which was done back in 2016, which was an online panel survey that was applied in 28 countries across, um, across Europe, including uh, European Russia. Um, 
And uh, for those of you who are familiar with this, you will know that there was a paper that was presented in 2020 um, on the first results of this household survey. But I just wanted to extend the, I'll, I'll go quickly through the findings of that first paper, but um, just to let you know that there's a second paper which is in press at the moment, which will be coming out very shortly. So I'll, I'll finish this by extending um, what I'm saying a little bit into the, the later um, analysis and the new results which uh, are, are due out in the next in the next few months. So um, I've just put up on this slide here just to, to sort of give you an indication of, of what we've got um, in this household survey. So we looked at eight different product groups and 45 species. So it doesn't include everything. It is a, a snapshot. We worked very hard on selecting the species which were included in the survey, but um, it's obviously not, not everything. Um, so we asked a lot of questions um, about um, socioeconomic status, uh, whether the person was urban and rural, um, which NTF, NWFP species they collected, what they did with them, what kind of weights they got from them. Um, as a panel survey, it's obviously all a little bit hit and miss because you can't really verify um, a lot of the data. But anyway, um, it's the best overview that we've got at the moment um, of what's happening in Europe. So we had 17,000 uh, responses to this um, and we found that overall across the whole of Europe, 26% of all households, that's all households, um, are engaged in NWFP collection, um, at least of those species that were included in the survey that we did. This amounts to about 30% of households in rural areas, but surprisingly, 24% of households in all urban areas, which implies that this is something which is universal. Everybody in Europe, whether you're in an urban area or a rural area, is almost equally likely to have a stake in non-wood forest product collection. Um, obviously, the consumption is, is, is a different thing. It's an average of about 2.2 people per household. So on the back of an envelope, you could take the number of households there are in Europe, take 26% of those and multiply by 2.2. And that gives you, you know, obviously millions and millions of people who are engaged in a personal level with the collection of NWFPs. Um, but you can see that from the, from the, from the bottom uh, chart that um, most people only go maybe for one trip to the forest or maybe one or two trips. And it's something of maybe um, a traditional uh, family outing to the woods in the, in the autumn to collect a few mushrooms or maybe an outing in, in earlier in the year to collect elderberries to make cough syrup um, as granny told you how to do, showed you how to do. Where do these people pick? So what we find is obviously we'd expect that most people pick from the forest. What we found is a bit more surprising that people are collecting quite a lot from agricultural land. So this will be um, hedgerows and, and from the meadows themselves. Um, but also people collect from urban areas. So a lot of the 24% of households in urban areas, um, many of them are traveling outside the urban area to find a forest to pick, but many of them are looking locally within the urban areas, um, parks, or gardens um, or, or sort of woodlands and green spaces within, within urban areas. So it's not something which you should think of as being um, solely um, a sort of like a rural production to urban consumption flow. It's, it's more complicated than that. What sort of things do people pick? I'm just going to run through this very quickly because it's it's a lot of uh, material. Um, so mostly we found that people were, are interested in collecting for their own use, wild berries, then followed by wild mushrooms, then nuts, then the maps, which we've just seen the, the short video on, and then decorative products. And this is for making wreaths or for decorating the house, um, branches and leaves, flowers, and then saps and resins and things start getting very, very small and truffles, you can see it's a tiny amount. So we can see that there's, there's certain products which are universally of interest to people and then others which are maybe um, more restricted in terms of who is interested in it or people just don't collect as much of it. So if I just run through this very, very quickly and um, for those of you the presentation I'm sure will be made available later. You can have a look at the actual species down the left hand side. But what I want to draw your attention to is what the people who are collecting it for their own use are doing with it, which is the right hand side. So you can see here for wild berries, a lot of it is freshly eaten, but quite a few things are made and made into jam and preserves. Wild mushrooms, mostly, eat, mostly freshly prepared, 
which you know cooked and, and eaten sort of as soon as people get them home. Forest uh, nuts, mostly dried and preserved. Um, and then wild and medicinal plants, um, people eating some of them as a green vegetable, drying them and making tea, making uh, soft drinks and cordials out of it. So the, the um, and then materials for use as decoration. Again, a lot of it is used fresh. So flowers and cones will be brought into the house to decorate the house, uh, particularly in spring. People might want to bring a, a spray of uh, willow catkins into the house as a kind of celebration of it. It's spring. Um, um, and, and obviously also at Christmas, people bring material into the house to decorate the house for the, for the season. Um, but there's also things like leaves and uh, the dry branches, which are created into more long, long lasting uh, decorations, you know, sort of that people uh, bring into their houses. Um, and then we've got saps and, and resins. So um, birch sap is a particularly a north and northeastern European sort of tradition where birch is tapped in the spring and used as a fresh drink. Um, and there's lots of innovation going on, obviously, in, in birch sap. And then we've got um, um, extracts of the Swiss pine cones goes into handicrafts. So it's the essential oils and things which they're taking out of those. Maple sap is obviously is um, also used as a fresh drink and then conifer resin used for medicinal preparations. So what we've got is a whole lot of different things that people are doing with the non-wood forest products that they are collecting. And I've just, th this isn't uh, by volume, this is just simply the species, um, the, uh, some of the previous charts that I've shown, just showing an indication of how much of this is, is prepared fresh um, and how much of it is, is um, turned into products in the home. Um, and you can see that obviously the and how much of it is is simply preserved and laid over as a kind of provisioning thing for for use in the winter. Um, so what we've got here is is that the majority of it is eaten fresh. So if we think about well, what do these things that people are doing mean to them? What is the social and cultural significance of these activities? We can see that it's we can talk about provisioning. I mean, people are eating it. Some people, um, certainly in Eastern Europe, are um, um, eating bigger volumes of it, um, possibly because of poverty, than, um, than, than people elsewhere. But even if you only have one uh, berry pie in a year, you're still provisioning in the sense that you're still consuming something yourself. The, that, the thing which on the previous one, which was about people using things fresh, um, is it's part of um, seasonal food culture and that varies a lot across Europe but many places in Europe have seasonal dishes which follow the uh, emergence of NTFPs. Here in the UK um, um, we, we, we have wild garlic but I think wild garlic is fairly universal um, across Europe um, as something which we eat in the spring um, and we look for it in the spring and it's a, it's a, a celebration of the, of the beginning of the year. So it's very important in seasonal food cultures. Um, it's also important to support traditional handicrafts um, and um, you know, people making baskets uh, for their own use or people um, using it as dye stuffs for, um, and that grades over into artisanal productions where people make a living out of making baskets or selling dye stuffs um, or making medicines. Um, so it's, it's strongly linked to tradition. It's strongly linked to artisanal practices and traditional uh, ways of, of using the forest to support life. And then also um, it's used as a, as a, for income. So people can sell the raw materials, they can sell the artisanal product that they've made. And we found in the uh, Star Tree uh, survey that about 0.5% of all households in Europe, NTFPs account for more than 50% of income. 0.5% um, sounds rather small, but if you, again, if you bulk it up by the number of people and you think that more than 50% of the income, this is significant, um, it's, it's comparable to the, the number of people who are employed in certain sectors of the forest industry. So it's, it again is very significant in terms of social support to people. But thinking about it in, more in terms of well, what do the individual people get from it? 
um, okay, you know, one berry pie a year is one berry pie. It's not very much, but what does that mean to the people who are engaged with it? And very often it's, we, we find that it's a, a seasonal social and family outdoor activity. So people would go and visit the grandmother and, and go out to the forest and uh, collect some mushrooms and, and have a traditional meal. And it will be part of family life and family tradition and will link people um, back to uh, places of, of origin to forests which they which um, their family have been engaged with for for generations um, in many in many play, uh, cultures in Europe um, giving gifts um, and giving gifts of things which you've you collected from the forest and you've made into things is very important in terms of family and social bonding and we found that 15% of households in Europe receive gifts of NTFPs. Now, these gifts traditionally would be something that the person, the giver, had invested effort in, that they'd gone to the forest and collected it and made the product. Increasingly, maybe, they might go and purchase the product and give that instead in lieu of, of the collection. But anyway, it's, it's, this is important for, for, for social bonds. In a personal level as well, um, especially with the COVID um, and, and everybody being cooped at home, there's a much greater appreciation of the significance to people's mental well-being um, and, and sense of self to be able to connect with nature. And being able to go and, and pick NTFPs, as I would suggest, is the most intimate connection with nature that you can have. You go and you search for something, you have to identify it, you have to know which season to go and where to look, and then you have to know how to clean it, how to pick it, um, how to prepare it, and, and you enjoy eating it. So it's, it's a very intimate connection with nature. Um, and it also connects, as I, I suggested earlier, with, with place and identity. Um, and it contributes to personal well-being. Now, some of these things are, are difficult, you know, can be um, monetized and some of them aren't. Um, but what I, my, my argument here is, is that the ones which aren't are no less important in terms of, of policy um, and, and, the, and what we want to achieve in terms of how our forests serve the people of Europe. Um, so this is just a few quotes just to show the significance of these, of these kind of personal connections with the process of, of collecting and using non-wood non forest products. So Emery, this is a study in Scotland in 2006, suggesting that the vast majority of collection is for household use, suggests the deeply personal nature of this connection. Some gatherers consider the activity fundamental to their personal identity as human beings, as Scots, in other words, as identifying as as, as an inhabitant of Scotland, a place, as members of their family or as individuals. And that's, this is really quite powerful um, for us over here in the UK where we, 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 we don't have very much forest um, and we are a very urban society, but still we, we, we find these things coming through. And then uh, a paper that we wrote in 2018, we considered that the NWFP collection for personal use fulfills identity and belongingness needs, as well as esteem and self-actualization needs for consumers. But there's another view on this as well. So, I mean, um, Lovic, the paper that's just about to come out, um, they were considering that recreational linked collection and their consumption are externalizations of urban affluent class taste, which um, I found a little bit denigrating in a sense, because um, it's sort of saying, oh, it's just the urban and affluent and it's just the fashion. But I think we, we need to look beyond this kind of um, market based approach to it and see these recreational users simply as a sink um, or a market for products which we might wish to sell to them. Their engagement in NT NWFP collection gives, provides an awful lot more to them than just simply something to consume or something to buy. And I think in our policy discourse, we need to, we need to consider this and, and how, to, how to serve that as well. Um, because that, that last comment really doesn't capture um, some of the things which, um, you know, the, the social values of it. I just wanted to have a look because we were doing our survey across Europe, it gives us a unique opportunity to look at variation across Europe to see where in Europe 
um, do these things mean more or less? Um, you know, how does that, how might that structure the way in which we think about things? So this is, um, th these are all in the 2020 paper, so many of you probably will have seen them already. So the frequency of NWFP collection by country. And you can see that here, um, I've picked out the countries which are involved in, in Incredible. Um, they're actually quite low. You can see that the Southern Europe is quite low and, and it's, um, in, in this paper, they actually put Southern Europe together with, with Western Europe as being quite low. And you can see that the center of activity where people uh, 60, 50, 60, nearly 70% of the population are engaged in personal collection is, is actually um, sort of like North, Northeast uh, Europe. So the quantities collected, um, so this is the median weight collected by the households that collect NWFPs. And again, you can see huge concentration in Eastern Europe where people are collecting the highest volumes of material. Um, and then we've got another one, which is the proportion of households which are gaining an income from um, the sale of NWFPs. And again, you can see that there's a, a variation across Europe with the highest concentrations again in the east and to the south um, of Europe. So what we've got is lots of gradients. And so we started throwing this into sort of multivariate analysis to see whether or not, well, okay, rather than just saying east, west, north, south, is there a way of actually understanding, you know, um, what's, what's going on here? And this is just to show the kinds of things that you can do. So this is the share of households that are consuming as the black bars and collecting are the grey bars. And this has, been, um, this has been roughly ordered. And you can see that... A, Moving from country to country, you can order countries in terms of, you know, the amount of collection, personal collection that takes place. And you can see that consumption is more or less level. It just tails off in the extreme west side of Europe where we've got almost no forest. And so we're, we're, we're losing that link with, with forest culture and with a desire to consume forest products. Um, so you can see some things are... You can see it's, it's a complicated situation. It's not very clear cut, like everybody is on one side or the other side. There are gradients between it. So from the latest multivariate analysis, which is uh, due to be presented in this paper, which is in press at the moment, um, we've actually further um, refined the analysis to identify um, three different categories of collectors. Um, so we've got recreational collectors, the people that I've just been sort of like um, advocating for the, the ones who go out and maybe, you know, uh, make a family gathering of it once or twice a year to go and collect it. You can see that 49% of all of the pickers are recreational pickers in Western and Southern uh, Europe. And Southern Europe here in, includes the Mediterranean. They tend to collect rather few products um, and they don't collect very much of it and they don't sell very much of it, but it means a lot to them. That, that activity. Um, and then you've got recreational collectors in Central Eastern Europe and in the North Baltic, where you can see that they collect slightly more products. Um, the weight that they collect is more and they sell a little bit more. Um, and you can see that these are the countries where there is a stronger tradition perhaps um, and greater participation in NWFP collection. And then we've got what we're calling hobby collectors. So hobby collectors are the people who um, you can see over on the right hand side, they're selling a little bit more um, and there's, there's, um, they're, they're collecting more products. They're, they're a bit more engaged with things. They're maybe making artisanal products and maybe selling, you know, some jams or some medicines or some gins or whatever it is that they might might have made and that they're collecting more. And then we come down to the small number of uh, professional pickers who are getting more than 50%, possibly 100% of their income from trading in um, non-wood forest products. And um, they, they've, they're collecting you know, huge amounts. So we've got 521. So what we've got, um, and they're obviously selling um, um, a lot of their a lot of the material that they collect and wholesaling it likely so what we've got is a small number of of pickers who are collecting huge amounts for sale and we've got a very large number of pickers collecting a very small amount for personal consumption and we've got these things happening on top of each other with the hobbyists kind of in the middle 
um, with a with a overall trend with more recreational picking perhaps in Western Europe and more of the professional picking across in Eastern and Southern Europe. But in every place you will see some elements of, of each of these. So we're suggesting that this kind of East-West dichotomy and the different needs of these different uh, NWFP collectors is an underlying contextual setting in which pol the policy uh, discourse needs to needs to be aware of and in which it needs to take place. We've had a few problems here in the UK of guidelines and policy being developed to support recreational pickers, which were then inappropriate for professional pickers, and guidelines prepared for, uh, and we were then um, finding that we had no appropriate guidelines for professional pickers. Um, and there is a trade-off between um, which of these categories you you um, conserve, um, and you need to think very hard about um, almost from place to place as to which might be the focus of of your your policy. Um, so this is just a few slides to show that in each of these there are innovations which are possible and there are in income opportunities which are possible. So in recreational pickers over um, what we're finding is, is that people are beginning to sell what they're calling experiential services, which are basically engaging with people in their own uh, picking and making a business out of showing people how to pick products, taking them to the forest, showing them how to prepare it, showing them how to weave a basket. And this can make very full-time incomes for people where they are not themselves trading in the product, they're trading in the knowledge and the experience of uh, engaging with, with NWFPs. Hobby pickers sort of sit in, sit in the middle. Um, they might do, this is just somebody doing some direct sales of foliage at a particular time of year. And then you've got professional pickers who are shifting tons of material. Um, and obviously these are, these are different. You can't, a policy that, need, that um, deals with, with each of these is, is obviously going to be complex. And even this uh, presentation that I've made doesn't cover all um, eventualities because traditional crafts, I mean, basket weaving, which I've mentioned a few times, was not included in the Star Tree survey. So there are many missing gaps and there are many very interesting questions still to be asked um, about um, how do we capture well-being? You know, um, if we're talking about an ecosystems approach, um, how do we deal with these? Um, you know, provisioning. We're, we're struggling with provisioning. You know, uh, quantifying provisioning within the NWFB sector. But how do we then start tackling issues to do with um, cultural integrity or um, a sense of place or personal well-being? Um, you know, it's it's a sort of a, a, a another challenge beyond the ones that we're dealing with right now. So that's just uh, a quick overview of the the references um, that um, I've used in in this presentation, and I think I'll draw it to a close there. Thank you so much, uh, Jenny. I think this was an extremely rich presentation. I think you just gave us a splendid overview of well what exists in the woods and, and this, the social dimension, dimension and relevance, uh, the social support, you refer to the cultural significance, to well-being, to, well, we might even include heritage to this, I think, the typology of, of collectors, uh, even if, like you stated, there are still missing gaps, so what do we do with these traditional crafts like baskets, etc.? So, a very rich presentation. In the meantime, we are seeing that there are a couple of questions coming in, so if you are willing to take a couple of these, that would be excellent. So, let me read the first. We had a question from um, Valentino, I need to find it here, yes, I have it. Uh, and, first of all, he congratulates you with uh, the very informative presentation and then it says a question do you think that the provisioning and cultural role of non-wood forest products in Europe will increase or change during and after the ongoing pandemic so he's trying to make the link to any effects or impact of COVID basically urban people are visiting more and more peruvian forested and agricultural areas he states and their gardens uh, as well during the lockdowns. Is this changing any provisioning patterns? Do you have any reflections on this? Um, 
it's a little bit difficult to say just yet because um, we're, we're not out of it yet. So it, it's, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm stuck here, um, you know, um, not able to leave the house as the same as everybody else. So it's, it's difficult to know what, what other people are doing. What we are finding is, is that people are exploring their local areas much more intensely than they have previously. Um, and, and that is actually creating a lot of pressure on local woodlands. Um, and um, we're certainly seeing a, a lot of that. Um, I, th I think that what we might see, um, certainly here, here in, the, in the UK, the discourse now is turning towards how we might meet people's needs for nature connection closer to where they live. Um, and we're hoping to capitalise on the fact that people have explored and know their local areas better because they've been, you know, they've been restricted to getting their exercise um, local to their homes. And we're actually thinking of um, what we're calling pocket forests and food forests, of actually bringing NTFP production into the urban environment. Um, so, uh, you know, a, a tree that's planted in an urban area could just as well be a wild fruit tree as it could be any, any other tree and encouraging people to um, to connect with that, so I, I think it's I think it's an opportunity because um, the general populace I think is is more aware than ever of the value of these things to them, and I think it's up to us to then um, capitalise on that and, and run with it. Excellent. Yeah. Well, we have an observation from Inatra and then a question. I will combine them in one uh, statement, basically. He says he was looking at the figures that you uh, have shown, and he said, well. Based on these figures, it means that 23,000 families actually make their living on wild non-wood forest birds in Europe, okay? Um, some 4 million families make 10% or more of their income with non-wood forest products, and 43 million families receive non-wood forest product gifts, basically. Well, if you, if you look at it, it's, it's just impressive. Huh? So there is a whole entire world behind these figures. And then he had a question, which uh, is, dear Jenny, he states, as this data is based on a survey, it refers to wild collection by citizens. So it does not capture the more professional sectors, such as uh, in mushrooms in some regions, but also cork, resin, pilots, and some aromatics that are given in concession. Is, is that correct? That's the question. Um, it's correct that it's a survey of citizens. And as a survey of citizens, it will pick up the people who are professional collectors in proportion to their representation within society as a whole. So, you know, that, that's, how sampling, that's how sampling works. So the 1% or so that we've got of those professional collectors is probably a, a reasonably realistic representation of the numbers that are, that are engaged in it. Um, and again, there's a concentration of those people in, in, in Eastern, Eastern Europe, but not you know, solely in Eastern Europe. Yeah. Okay. okay, well, thank you for this statement. I'm looking at the time. I'm afraid we, because it's a topic that is so fascinating, I think we could stay together here listening to your explanations for another hour at least, and it would still be fascinating, right? Uh, but unfortunately, we have a program, and I think you need to continue and uh, go to the next step. Thank you so much for your very rich presentation. We really appreciated it. I hope you can stay with us. So let's move on, ladies and gentlemen. And as the next point of our program, we will take a look at a specific outcome of this project in terms of policy recommendations, policy recommendations on non-wood forest products. And to that extent, we have basically two persons that have been key to a lot of the work done on this topic. It's Sara Maltoni. She's uh, from the General Directorate of Forestas in Sardinia. And also Alvaro Picado. He's a forest engineer at Junta de Castilla y León in Spain. But I believe the presentation will be the result, uh, delivered by Sara. Uh, so Sara, yes, you can co please the floor is yours. Let me just briefly state, as we only have something like 10 minutes for this presentation, uh, it will be difficult to take questions for this presentation. You can still post your questions, but it might be that we don't have the time to handle this. That being said, Sarah, please. 
Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Stephen, for your kind introduction. Thanks to Isa for um, hosting this, uh, this final conference. Uh, I will talk about policy recommendations for non-wood forest products developed within the incredible project. And I would like to acknowledge the contribution of Alvaro Picardo from the Junta de Castilla y León to this presentation, whom I thank. Uh, I will break it down in four main topics. Why do we need policy recommendations on non-wood forest products? Where do these recommendations stem from? And what have been our achievements and outputs? And our final call for action. So policy recommendations are needed because although non-wood forest products have been present in the political debate in the last 30 or 40 years since the interministerial conferences, um, they have been named uh, wild forest products, minor non-timber forest products in several ways, but in terms of real action, they have had and received limited uh, attention. And this in spite of their high um, value, as has been ex uh, explained uh, in the um, keynote speech, and they are still insufficient, insufficiently acknowledged. In fact, they are part of Europe's cultural legacy. They contribute to human health and well-being. As just explained, they contribute to our and diversify our diets, our leisure time, our personal connection to, to the forest. They contribute to many of the United Nations sustainable development goals in their social, environmental and economic dimension. And this is a slide just to show an overview of the SDGs they contribute to in social, environmental and economic terms. Um, in, uh, specifically in economic terms, their current value and potential is very difficult to size and very hardly captured in statistics and foresights because they are very often self-consumed, um, they are traded in informal markets, they are uh, undervalued and um, we have some data that can help us size their economic importance, the ones that have uh, resulted from the Star Tree project, uh, which gives a value of around 23 billion euros per year in just in Europe. And this is well uh, over the, the, the formal estimates we have in trade. Uh, every household, almost every household in Europe regularly consumes non-wood forest products. Over a quarter go foraging every year. And Europe is also a great trader, a great importer. It counts for about 50% of the global imports of non-wood forest products and 40% of the exports. So despite this huge value, uh, they are still underrepresented or unrevealed and they represent an untapped source of nature-based solutions that could, in fact, significantly contribute to Europe's policy priorities in the framework set by the European Green Deal. And there are many policies where non-wood forest products should play uh, a role increasingly. Uh, policy processes that are underway or upcoming, like the common agricultural policy post-2020 for the value they have in our agroforestry ecosystems. The new industrial strategy, because they are the base of bio-based natural um, industrial sectors for cork, resin, uh, for pharmaceuticals and cosmetics. Uh, the EU farm to fork strategy, because many of them are uh, edibles. Uh, of course, the EU forest strategy. Uh, and so this is the right time to spell out the policy actions that are needed and to feed them into these policy process uh, for reaching the sustainable development targets and the European Green Deal. So where do these policy recommendations stem from? Uh, surely from the multi-stakeholder interactions and the lessons learned from across the Mediterranean basin developed within the uh, incredible uh, initiatives. So incredible is organized in innovation networks in five INETs spanning from resins, cork, aromatic and medicinal plants, wild mushroom and truffles, wild nuts and berries. And for each of these events, 
several uh, for, of these INETs, several events have been organized from scoping seminars to define the roadmap to science to practice event to close the gap between academia, research and uh, practice, into regional seminars to cross cut uh, across countries, cross cutting seminars for a um, sharing experiences across different sectors, open innovation challenges, training sessions on key topics, and finally, the International Policy Forum. And all these events has, have left us with a wealth of information uh, leading to the policy recommendations um, that have, have been reviewed by key organizations like USAFOR, uh, used our forest services, <laughs> Sorry, um, the Food and Agriculture Organization, which has been a co-organizer and co-editor of the, the white paper. Uh, and we, of course, tried to capitalize the previous research foundings, findings from especially Star Tree Project and the cost action on non-wood forest products. Also, we have received very interesting feedbacks from the UFRO task force on non-timber forest products. In particular, we had uh, an online webinar uh, on um, 16th and 17th of September, um, where we met and revised through an online peer review process through an, uh, an online canvas experiences this uh, uh, new, uh, not in presence, but uh, exchange uh, on this canvas. And this uh, has led us to uh, summarizing all the policy recommendations into what we called <laughs> Uh, um, a white paper, uh, which is a summary of the um, policy and policy actions uh, that is present in a draft and will soon be shared in the Incredible Forest webpage. Um, the actions in the white paper um, are summarized, um, broken down in four areas. First of all, securing the conservation of non-wood forest products and ensuring supply for the value chains and for consumption, which is increasing. Uh, building competitive and equitable non-wood forest products value chains through innovative business model, increased um, uh, competitiveness, but also the issues of transparency, data and information flow and providing the necessary enabling conditions. And all these are broken down in sub actions and described uh, in uh, the white paper. Uh, we don't have the time to get into the details of each of them, but they span from uh, means to enhance the resource space, improve harvest levels, um, improve monitoring systems to ensure sustainable sourcing. Uh, they go through developing uh, innovative fiscal and labor regimes, increasing equitability and association among producers, issues about visibility, innovative labeling, uh, and also uh, providing the coherence of the institutional action, improving financial support and innov innovation. These actions have been presented in the policy forum last month, which ga gathered 250 people from over 33 countries. Uh, many, we had people from uh, the Council of the European Union, the DGs, uh, European Commission, uh, governments, academia, uh, entrepreneurs and sectoral organizations. And you can find the, the presentations at this link below and the videos. And finally, at the forum, we came up with the manifesto, our call for action, to get the support and the compromise for action among institutions, associations and enterprises. And here you can find the link to the, the draft manifesto, which is at its final stage, and it's really a call for signing an action, a commitment to promote non-wood forest products for the inclusive and green growth. So finally, the, our call for action. Uh, the policy recommendations call up especially to policymakers. They have a privileged position to change pace, to change course. They must recognize, uh, you know, governments um, uh, and legislators at all levels. They must recognize non-wood forest products as part of our collective heritage 
as a relevant but mostly important informal economic sector where natural resources deserve proper attention and coherent policy frameworks. Governments in particular should propose legislation to regulate cl clearly the picking and harvesting activities, labour conditions, uh, taxation and trade, and secure equitability along uh, the value chains. The European Commission in particular should uh, identify the most produced and collected non-wood forest products in member states and uh, coordinate um, through European programs for, um, targeted to key non-wood forest products. Uh, it should provide the framework for adequate labelling, for example, of wild products um, and incorporate it into statistics uh, and, um, and trading um, data. But it is not all about legislators. Market operators have a wealth of information that could be shared uh, in the limits possible. So sharing information, respecting due diligence systems when they are mandatory for food, for example, but also adopt due diligence systems uh, through voluntary schemes uh, to secure the sustainability and traceability uh, of these value chains. Producers, in turn, should integrate in different types of organization to strengthen the bonds along and across value chains. Local development agencies and agricultural and forestry advisory services should support uh, with, through an increased capacity and knowledge all these initiatives. And the research community should support filling the knowledge gaps NGOs could encourage and facilitate action and consumers, once better informed, should empower themselves to better uh, and more responsible and sustainable purchases. So above all, we must all pursue a shared vision on a desirable, sustainable and plausible future and advance towards uh, a, com a common understanding of the interlinkages between nature conservation and sustainable forest management. Uh, this st stronger connection between human intervention and nature conservation. Uh, and collectively reflect on the production and consumption patterns that will help us advance towards a sustainable, circular and inclusive uh, bioeconomy for Europe. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Sarah, for a wonderful overview. It's, it's almost impossible, we know that it's, it's impossible to, to, to just depict the, the, the huge efforts in, in full detail, the huge efforts that have been done throughout this project. Um, there is no real time for lots of questions. Uh, what I would like to do, though, is perhaps give you the opportunity, you or Alvaro, but then please make it short, to make a statement on a question raised by Margarita, and that is, by now, did you have any reaction from politicians? We've been pushing very hard huh, to provoke some reaction, to feed the policymaking processes, but did we have any reaction? Can you make a very short statement of that? Perhaps both of you, but please keep it short. Alvaro, you, you go first. I prefer you go, ah. Well, uh, on a personal view, the, the policy forum was very interesting and we felt the engagement of the ministries, the Ita Italian ministries, but other ministries as well, uh, into, this, into the policies needed for non-wood forest products, understanding that be below, uh, beyond timber, there is a wealth of, of goods and services to tap. Uh, also, we had very positive reactions from the European Commission and the DG uh, Agriculture and Environment and from the EU Councils. Uh, I think it is the best reactions we, we could hope for uh, and delivering the white paper uh, with a listing, uh, a summary of the actions that uh, need to be done, help them understand where they can tap the actions and put them in the right place in their policy, in the policy process they are, that they are dealing with. So I will, I will, I'm very confident. Alvar. Thanks. And from my side, I would say that also yesterday we had the, the seminar on, on resin and I 
I think that we need action on several levels, several territorial levels, several sectors and products. And the contact, the, the participation yesterday of the coordinator of the forest technology platform was also very, very positive. So that we can really, in, in an effective way, incorporate these non-wood forest products into the research and innovation agenda for Europe. So we are, we are in this, we are the, with the commission, we are with the stakeholders, we are also with FAO and, and proposing parallel uh, processes in other areas. And, and just yesterday, someone contacted me to, to put in place uh, an action on resin in other parts of the world. And, and also, I would suggest since it came from, from Portugal, that having incorporated uh, a strategic plan for resin in Portugal, in the recovery plan, that's, that's also an excellent initiative. So I think that we will probably see a key a milestones in the coming years that probably have, have had an influence from this uh, incredible process and policy forum. Excellent. Thank you so much for these uh, short statements. I know we have to, you, you also know that we have to keep it short here. Unfortunately, it's very interesting. Uh, and the signs are very promising, which is a very good thing. May I ask you, because we've noted that there are uh, additional questions coming in in the chat, please could you take the effort of, of checking the chat and perhaps even deal with the questions in the chat. And may I ask the same to Jenny Wong, please, if there are, if you find additional questions in the chat, you have the facility to, to also respond and to add to the chat feed. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is, uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Sarah Maltoni for a wonderful presentation and uh, both of you for taking up uh, the question. Now, let's proceed with our program and we will now move on and basically shift to what I uh, initially described as a series of short presentations. And it's all about highlights in these innovation networks, right? So if I mention a series of presentations, it is because we're going to show you five short presentations in succession. No, it is the shorter the presentation, the bigger the challenge to deliver a nice impactful presentation. Right? So these five persons each represent, if you like, one of these innovation networks that have been active in uh, Incredible. And they each would like to not talk about the work packages and tasks and deliverables, like I mentioned before, but about specific highlights or achievements that I think we all can be very proud of. Right? And they will do so in a very specific presentation format. It's short in time huge amount of sites and all graphical in nature. Let me introduce the first speaker, who is going to be Sven Mutke. He's the head of service for forest industries, INEA, in Spain. And he will deliver a presentation on encouraging dialogue and exchange of knowledge across neighboring sectors. And he basically represents, if you like, this innovation network of wild nuts and berries. Sven, the floor is yours. Okay, good morning. Thank you. Well, um, I'm Sven Mutka. I'm working at the Forest Research Center at the NIA Madrid. And I will not speak about technical issues, but about the social part of the learning part, the mutual learning in our group. So it's in, about encouraging the dialogue and the knowledge exchange. I hope this will run. Okay. Um, so the white nuts and berries um, from the Mediterranean are the yeah you're looking at your title screen uh, yeah i'm i'm hope it will run if not I, I will just give me a minute i will try to run it again Just take your time, Sven. Yeah. This online events, it's always a bit uh, technical with the hiccups, etc. So don't worry. Okay. Let's try it. 
once again, I will, will go through this. Now it's running, but not. Yes, it's not your first slide. Yeah. Maybe you have to manually launch. Okay. Okay. Anyway, let's try. So anyway, let's see if it's run. Um, the question is that um, there are a lot of um, berries and nuts from the Mediterranean that are part of the of the culture uh, and the culinary heritage of the Mediterranean, and some of them are. If this will run, will it? Will it not? Funny enough. Okay, I hope it should run now. So um, let, let's uh, start hoping that it will run. So uh, there are several berries and nuts and the most important maybe are the chestnuts and the pine nuts from the stone pine or umbrella pine. Um, because we are... Uh, Sven, uh, Sven yeah. can I just take a word? Uh, Sven, uh, it seems there is a technical hiccup. W what I suggest is that you take the time to, to find out what happens. And Switch to the other time. one, okay. And in the meantime, we just uh, go uh, for the second presentation. And yeah, I'll please. You, you turn to you. Is that okay for you? Yeah, of course. Okay, excellent. Let's do it like this. So let me then move on to um, and introduce Aida. Rodriguez, she is the project coordinator uh, or project coordinator at uh, CESEFOR in Spain, and she will deliver a presentation on increasing transparency in the resin supply chain. So we are changing networks. We are talking about the innovation network of resin. Aida, are you ready to take up the, the floor? I hope so. Let's try. You're looking at the okay. right. And you send my, my screen? It's wonderful. Yes, you can go. Okay. Ahead. So, over the next minutes, I'm going to introduce you to the Resin 9 at Flagship initiative to increase transparency in Resin supply chain. So, we start here. All these uh, daily products contain resin, but uh, first, most of consumers will never know this. And second, even when we know it, it's really impossible to know the source of this resin. Does it come from some forest of our region, or is this a hydrocarbon product that has traveled a thousand of miles? It is really impossible to have this information in the current market. Since the beginning of the resin INET, one of the main aspects that all members have agreed to highlight is that in order to valorize a product such as resin, it is strategic to make it visible at the final products. The resin is a raw material that undergoes many transformation until it reaches the final product that we consume. This generates a considerable lack of knowledge on the part of the final consumer, which prevents its valorization as the natural and sustainable product that it is. On the other hand, we have another thread that this product face in order to be a reference for rural development and is the competition with fossil fuel origin resin. These competitors of natural resin are widely exposed and due mainly to their price. They occupy large market needs that could be occupied by natural resins. We are all well aware of the great values of tapping activity and resin. It is a sustainable activity which produces a renewable product and it is associated with the conservation of a large number of ecosystem services. We can highlight for the Mediterranean areas, the reduction of forest fires or, or the fixation of rural population that is clearly associated to this activity. But for this value to be socially recognized, they present in the final products must be visible to the consumers. So to achieve this identification, was one of the main reasons to design this app, the Resin app. This product has been developed by the SAS Forest Plus project, 
and it's near to be finished. We hope this year we'll finish it. This is a traceability application that allows the tracking of this product, the resin, from the forest where it's obtained to the factory where its first transformation is carried out. So to explain in a simple way how it works, we can see the following images. Here we see the, 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 the forest where the, the resin is extracted. And here the, the tapping worker with the app installed on his phone will identify the barrels, the barrels we can see here with this QR code, and we will send the notification to the transporter and to the industry to inform that the material is ready. Next, the transporter, which have also the, the app in his, in his or her mobile, uh, he receives the information, organize the route of collection, and take the virus to the industry with the product clearly identified. And here at the factory, the virus arrives with this uh, codes clearly identified, and um, the, the, the barrels are weighted and the information is stored at the, at the factory. And at this point, we have the information about where exactly this resin has been produced. And after that, they can send the information also to the tapping worker. And in this way, he knows the state of his, of his product. So the contribution of the incredible project and in particular of the resin in it within the development of this product is a direct consequence of the incredible main core, that is to build this bidirectional channel to connect science and practice, to connect and share the knowledge of the, the, the knowledge, the best practices of researcher, technician, forest owners, among other stakeholders. In this sense, the development of this tool is a really good example of how incredible has built this connection and shared this best practice. The resin app has been presented in different events that are part of this resin roadmap. Here we can see some images of Crosscut seminars, science to practice events, and in all these forums, it has been explained, discussed, and its potential to generate improvements in the sector has been shared with all the members of the networks, all the participants in its correspondent uh, event. So interesting opportunities for its development in other countries have been highlighted and have served an as inspiration along the years of the project. And the lesson learned for, from other traceability applications has been incorporated and have, have made the app grow and, and grow along these events. The integration of new knowledge and the vision from experts, as for example, here we can see an example of yesterday, the workshop that we have been developing uh, on the importance of traceability for certification in the bio-based resin sector will be an added value for this tool. In summary, this, uh, it shows as a flagship in our INET is clear as it is a great example of how a project such as Incredible put its support, its networks, and its activities at the service of this type of innovation. We think that this tool is a significant example of how the tradition and the newest technology can do great things together in the non-good forest product world. We hope not only that the development of this product will bring hopeful change in the resin value chain in Spain, but also that it will be an example for other countries and other non-good forest products. So thank you for your attention. And that's all from my side. Thank you so much, uh, Aida. I think you made a wonderful effort to make it work. Um, now, what I would like to suggest is that we just continue our series of presentations. We had a little bit of a technical hiccup at the time. This can happen. It's, it's part of this uh, new world with all these online conferences. And in spite of all the wonderful technologies we have, sometimes strange things keep happening. So let's, let's try again. Sven, I see you're already sharing your screen. Do you want to give it another try? Sven, you're muted. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The presentation yeah. is changing, so it's, it seems good. Okay. Let's try. So, once again, um, there are a lot of nuts and berries from the Mediterranean, and they're especially um, the pine nut and the chestnut as a, a star product, maybe. And um, both of them 
are moving several million hectares uh, euros a year in in the production, um, not only from forest but also plantations. Of course, both of them has suffered a lot of um, problems the last decade due to exotic pests and pathogens. Um, the chestnuts during the 20th century due to, to fungal diseases, the ink disease and the, and the chestnut blight. But in the last 10 years, there were two insects introduced to Europe, the conifer seed bug Leptoglossus, that sucks the pine nuts and destroys the, the yield. And uh, the chestnut gall wasp that produces galls in the buds of the tree, so the, the tree will not bear any fruit anymore. In case of uh, chestnut, it's its uh, traditional food, a staple food until the 10th century, and there's a long tradition of um, cultural heritage and of um, influence in the landscape. There are some clusters like El Bierzo region in, in Spain or Ardèche in France with a long tradition of chestnut harvesting, and they have set up a, a European network on collaboration of producers and research and so on that uh, joins the uh, Portuguese REFCAS, the uh, cluster of Ibirs in, in Spain, or the French uh, colleges in this Eudo chestnut, Eudo castania network. On the other hand, pine nuts are mostly, pine cones are mostly called, collected still from, from forest, and only in the last 20 years we have advanced in the domestication of setting up plantations of, um, of pine nuts, and that's my background as forester in the development of these plantations. Um, so we have these two existing networks, but we had little contact. So Incredible was a really good chance to bring us together to learn uh, from each other and to, to, to make a mutual learning. So we, we had uh, former projects with Portuguese, with Tunisians and with French partners, and this was our development. The first meeting was a scoping seminar, and there I had to learn because before I've worked mainly with trees. So looking to, to, to foster the production of cones from the forest and plantations. And suddenly I had to treat with stakeholders, with people. And the, it was not only about the, the primary production, but, but about processing, the trade, the, the exportation and so on, statistics, and treating with stakeholders of all this value chain. So it was a, a learning process. Because it's not only value chain, but if you look on a wider ecosystem. There are a lot of agents implied, actors implied there. There are other uh, interests in the forest. There's a, the administration that, that set up the uh, framework. There are the research community, of course, contributing there. But then again, the, the, the first finding of this meeting was the aspect that a good part of non-wood forest products, even pine nuts, is informal. And informal m m might be um, private for self-consumption, but it means also informal and illegal. That, that means that um, uh, robbery exists, that a black market exists, that non-declaration ex exists. And as the stakeholder pointed out in the meeting, um, black market means a lack of standards, lack of guarantees, lack of fair trade. And uh, so the, the supply chain is not uh, always transparent. So this was one learning for me that the, the problem with pests and diseases is one problem, but uh, if you do not control what to do your, with your product, you, you do not make anything else. So one example was in this meeting about uh, standards and labels. Um, there was this guy from, from Provence who told us that he actually travels every month uh, up to Switzerland to sell the, his custom products, chestnut products in street market because, because more profitable than selling to the local um, processor in Provence. That's just one example, but one example is that shows that really without value chain development, it's only a provisional solution. Okay, biological control, of course, was in, in charge too in, in the meeting. So we learned from the chestnut sector that had be able to um, solve the major, major problems by looking for resistant rootstocks or for doing inoculation by hyperventral strains for, for other fungi, or for example, the, the question for parasitoids. For example, um, millions of Torimus parasitoids are released against the Gavost every year. So they have been able to, to solve this problem. Whereas the pineal sector uh, is less structured and we really struggle to solve this problem of this um, seed bug that has mainly destroyed the, the um, yield for years. 
Then again, we have the climate change and we are observing the Mediterranean, the switch from some species like, for example, maritime pine. Um, this, this is um, losing the, the struggle against climate change must be replaced. Stone pine might be a winner there, but actually for improving the pine nut production, we will need plantations. We need domestication and we might we need optimized management from, from this plantation. And this was another workshop we organized um, in Portugal. In other countries like Tunisia, there are other forest products like, for example, Aleppo pine seeds that can be used for local specialities like this um, um, desert. So there are a lot of examples to, to, to be shared. Concluding, incredible is more about um, collaborating, about network, about open innovation. That means that um, the way the transition is from linear structure, like linear research from researchers, development, and then market release um, to a multi-actor and multi-purpose research network. So same as a linear fossil-based economy model is going to a circular green bio-based economy to a by smart innovation. So some example of this are this EP Agri um, operational group set up around this non-wood forest products mm. or this um, Prima um, project, uh, ongoing Prima, Prima project product where a lot of incredible partners are involved. And just for example, this, this um, operational group on pine nuts has been able to to, to, to be pre-selected in the call of the Spanish ministry. So um, the pioneer sector has learned this lesson, lessons too. And I hope that the involvement in the incredible has been one helping in this. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sven. And I would like to congratulate you on managing, I mean, you, if you have a technical uh, hiccup at a moment like this, you have to find a remedy. And at the same time, people maybe don't realize this, but all of the speakers know they were basically put, put under huge pressure because I announced that they would only have seven minutes and that they would need to prepare a specific uh, format. And both uh, you, Sven, as well as Ida before, you managed beautifully. You just kept it into seven minutes, which is Perfect, congratulations for that. Let's move on to the next speaker. And the next speaker, the third person in our series, uh, will be talking about the INET, the Innovation Network of Aromatics and Medicinal Plants, but he will be focusing on ensuring traceability, identity and tracking products originated from aromatic and medicinal plants, a transversal traceability uh, tool. His name is Anton Brenko. He's a forest engineer at Croatian Forest Research Institute. He's also one of the project partners. Anton, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephen, for your introduction. I hope you can see my presentation. So the idea of uh, developing a traceability tool was born during the aromatic and medicinal plant interregional workshop, which was organized in the city of in Croatia in December 2019. The traceability tool was intended to serve as a flagship initiative for this particular INET. So the principle was very simple. To place a QR code on the product from which you could trace the species of origin, the place of origin, the method of harvesting, harvester, processor and producer of each particular product. By scanning the QR code, potential buyer could decide which product suits his needs and the producer could provide more details on his product and present it with information that couldn't fit onto the product label. Although the principle was very simple during the system development, it became, it became obvious that it is going to be time consuming for producers to add product information because one would need to repeat steps from species, species foraging to final product multiple times in order to provide the full traceability. And in the light of this uh, pandemic situation, the sole added value of product presentation was decreasing in its practicality. So in order to simplify the process of adding a product and to provide an added value that will really have an impact on rural economy, a new idea was born, the Forest Fruits Online Marketplace. The traceability features remained with added option to trace ingredients, 
And although it was at start designed as an aromatic and medicinal flagship initiative, it can be used for all inmates, for mushroom and truffles, for nuts and berries, for cork and raisin, with added option to actually sell final products and raw material. The content you see on the screen is here only for testing purposes, but it also displays all the functionalities of the marketplace. Each product contains description, ingredients, sold by link, traceability section, price, add to cart option and add to favorites option in case the consumer is not ready to make a purchase, but wants to save the product for later. If you take a look at the traceability section, you will notice that the names of each particular value chain representative can be added. Also, if they have a website, an external link to their website can be created. The shipping costs are added by producers or sellers and can be product-based or weight-based. Each producer can decide for himself whether the product can be shipped outside his country or not. Forest Fruits is an online marketplace for nature-based products. Here you will be able to buy products directly from producers, or you can start selling your products directly to buyers without any intermediaries. The biggest value of this marketplace is that you can buy traceable delicacies or a high value product on a global scale. And when I say high value, I do not mean it only costly-wise. Forest Fruits is free to use. The system will be maintained from a small fee only from sold products without shipping costs. In return, producers will get translations on several languages, customer support, system development, and most precious of all, free advertising. I invite you all to become a beta tester. Forest Fruits online marketplace is still in its development phase. And if you contribute to the development today, you will earn the possibility to sell your products commission-free. All you need to do is enter your contact email in the provided field, and we will contact you as soon as the system becomes ready for testing. The registered producers will gain access to the back end of the marketplace where they will be able to edit their contact and bank account information, payment preferences, local taxes, shipping rules, store policies. They will be able to add new products and edit existing ones, track orders and customers, create various sales reports, answer to inquiries, ask for support, and much, much more. Also, a mobile app will be developed for buying and selling products on the go. So if you would like to sell your products online, but you don't have the resources or knowledge how to develop a web shop, visit forestfruits.com and join our soon to be global network of certified producers. Thank you for your attention. My congratulations, Anton. You also managed to respect the time and to offer a beautiful presentation with lots of graphical content. And it's basically, it, it's such an important, uh, achievement that you uh, managed to, to bring to a good end. It is offering, it's a website, but it's much more. It, it's handling this traceability issue. It's, it's offering, creating visibility to this uh, producers of non mood forest products, and at the same time, offering an additional sales channel. I think this is perfectly addressing one of these or several of these challenges that we identified in this project. Thank you. Now, before we move on to the next uh, presentation, I would like to take a short break just to cut, if you like, this, this series. Five would perhaps be a little bit too much in a row. And let us just watch a short movie. It's a video which is one of the green tails. And you will find if after this conference, you have a little bit of time to explore the website of the incredible project, you will see that you will find a section that contains lots of videotaped stories. We label them green tails. All of them are basically stories on aspects of um, uh, these non wood forest products. And we are going to look now at one of these, just to give you a flavor. It is about cork debarking. We can launch the video now.
So, well, ladies and gentlemen, this was just one of these many green tales we have. And you will see, if you, if you explore them, there are very interesting stories about many aspects of these non-wood forest products. But Cork, a video on Cork, is an excellent bridge to the next presentation. So the next presentation is indeed a result, if you like, of this innovation network of Cork. So let me introduce Conceição Santos Silva, who is going to be our next speaker. And she is the Research Development and Innovation Coordinator at UNAC in Portugal. And she will be talking about promoting marketability of non-wood forest products, core commercialization guide. Conceição, the floor is yours. Hello, Stephen. Good morning. Let me just share my screen, hoping for that everything runs OK. Can I just check that you are seeing the full screen, please? Yes, I'm looking at the full screen. It's OK. Thank you. So, good morning, all. My name is Conceição Santos Silva, and on behalf of the Cork INET, I'm here to tell you about our flagship initiative, the Cork Commercialization Guide. As you know, the Cork is produced all around the Mediterranean basin, being Portugal and Spain the main producers, but really, you have Cork forests along all these countries with different cultures and different landscapes and different land owners, of course. But even so, even having so many different forests and all of them don't seem like the one that you see here, you can have more trees, less trees, more cattle or not. Uh, in fact, all of these landowners have a very common thing when they need to sell their cork and in, enter the market every year. All the cork is, or the most part of the cork, is still harvested manually. And this job, this very skilled job, has very specific rules that need to be followed by all the landowners in order to maintain the cork quality in the present and only in the future. And these rules should be known by all the landowners and not only by the professional ones. You have to decide on whether to pile your cork or transport it directly to the factory. And if you decide to pilot, you have to know already the rules to do it in order not to devaluate your cork. In the wrong way of piling it, you can lose money. So all of these decisions that you have to take every time that you need to negotiate uh, the, the landowner's cork, they need to be aware how to do it, when to do it, with whom should they do it, if they should harvest before or after the commercialization. So, and these, all of these decisions are even worse if you can only go to the market from nine to nine years, because you don't know what happened to the cork market prices and about the core characteristics of your own farm. How did they uh, evolve along the nine years? Did they increase? But what you know for sure, and it's common, is that you have in the market a very small number of strong players that, uh, that are the buyers, and you have a scattered offer along thousands of landowners in these countries that go to the market every year to sell their cork. And what you know also is that the price of the cork, it's not a stable price over time. In the yellow line, you can see the variation of price of a cork with stable characteristics between 1992 and 2019. And you cannot rely on the price that you sold nine years ago because it's not the same nowadays. So within the cork INET, we asked ourselves, how can we raise awareness on this issue and improve the marketability of cork in a transversal way among all of these landowners from the different producer countries? What can we do? First of all, we start by doing a science to practice event addressed for technicians, public administration and also academia discussing the core quality classification and how to promote the, the marketability. But in fact, we felt in the end of the science to practice events taken in Tunisia and also in Italy that we need some physical support to disseminate the information to, to the landowners. And so in Portugal and also in Spain, but we had this guide that we published in 2013, a core commercialization guide. And through this incredible project, we have been able to create new editions with regional context adapted for each one of the countries. 
What can you expect from this cork commercialization guide? Raise awareness on the different quality of cork that is produced in all the nine, the nine years. You have different qualities and different calipers also. Having always uh, a set up in your mind that the goal are the cork stoppers. All these fashionable cork products that you can see here are just that fashionable. They are very important to raise the awareness of the society. They are not the goal in terms of production because they are made with less quality cork. So it's very important for the landowner to know the cork that he is uh, sending to the market. So this guide also includes the available tools that you can find near the associations uh, to, to help you, uh, to help the landowners knowing the quality of the cork and the market prices. Also, it includes a set of the 10 commandments of the cork harvester, helping the landowners to know when to harvest, how to harvest, when they should stop the barking, and some useful rules to decrease the biotic risks that sometimes uh, uh, decrease the quality of the cork. But they also need to know about the contract and the different methods of commercialization. So you have the pros and cons of the different methods. You also more information on the humidity content and how they can impact the value that you are discussing and some hidden margins that relate to some discounts that sometimes are introduced, introduced in the contract. So 2021, through the incredible project, there will be available uh, the core commercialization guides in five different languages addressing six different countries that can all the landowners can easily assess. But this is just the beginning of this flagship initiative. It's just the beginning of a path that we need to, to go among the Mediterranean countries where cork is produced. We need observatories, commercialization, platforms, and common statistical data also. And as information is only useful for everyone, if it's easily accessible, I would like to finish with all the websites where you can soon, very, very soon, find the core commercialization guide. Thank you all. Congratulations, Consesso. This has been a wonderful presentation. Excellent pictures, beautiful, well in time. You, 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 you have teached us upon these 10 commandments of the cork harvester. <laughs> I took notice of that. <laughs> but I think the creation of this guide is a major achievement. I know because I could witness how much it took uh, the, the in terms of collaboration and efforts. And I think it's something that this island of cork can really be proud of. Now, let's move on to the next speaker. Until now, we have been visiting Spain, we have been visiting Croatia, we just now uh, visited uh, Portugal. Let's move a little bit to the east, to Greece, because also in Greece we have a project partner and we have, still have a remaining uh, network that we have to visit. It's the Innovation Network of Mushrooms and Truffles, that's network number five of our incredible project. And there will be a presentation on supporting policy making legal framework and proposal for management and certification of wild mushrooms in Greece. And the presentation will be delivered by Calliope Stara. She's research and lecturer at the UOE in Greece. Calliope, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I, I hope that you see my presentation. Is everything okay? Yes, it's not in full screen mode, but your presentation is being broadcast, yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. So the presenting mode. Something. Yes, it seems to be working. Now, so I will explain you uh, how our incredible team and uh, Mushroom and Truffles INET uh, supported the uh, policy in Greece, uh, helping to the creation of uh, the proposal for a legal framework uh, on Mushroom and Truffles. First of all, I, I should say that uh, uh, Greece uh, is a mycophobic uh, country. That means that in every local area or village, no more than uh, five species are traditionally uh, picked. And this has as a result the lack of a legislative framework at the national level. However, this does not mean that we have not a legislation framework at all. 
Uh, we have a general run uh, for secondary products, as we used to call uh, the non-tiber forest products. And uh, we have a local harvest forest decision that uh, regulate uh, the amounts that uh, can be harvested uh, uh, locally. Uh, the, um, the permission to, to hunt of, for truffle hunting or not and uh, uh, include, they include uh, a catalog of prices uh, in which until very recently mushrooms were in the same box uh, um, uh, with mosses and lichens. However, recently we have the same uh, mycophilic explosion, we could say, with the creation of uh, a lo lots of uh, local mushroom associations uh, that organize a lot of events uh, and uh, uh, create a lot of publications. And also we have uh, a recent uh, natural history museum dedicated on mushrooms and the town in West Macedonia, Grevena, that builds a new identity on mushroom picking. And of course we have uh, uh, companies uh, who trade mushrooms uh, 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 nationally and internationally, very high quality products and the taste of wild is not missing in Greece where mushrooms has been tra transformed from the meat of the poor people as we used to call them in the past to a gourmet delicacy. Uh, however, in the backyard of this uh, nice situation there are uh, many problems to be solved. Uh, like in the uh, rest of Mediterranean and European countries, like the illegal trade, uh, pickers with no official training, and unknown quantities that are harvested from the forest. To solve this situation, the Ministry of uh, Rural Development and Food in 2015 set up a working, uh, a mas a working group on mushroom policy and finally, this group uh, published uh, a report, a proposal in 2019, and uh, our incredible INET, and before the cost action, uh, sometimes with the same people working for all these years, we supported all this effort with uh, several ways, but uh, uh, mainly giving to the people a place for a dialogue and when I say to the people, I mean to all the protagonists of the value chain and from the administration to the amateur or professional pickers and consumers that had no before uh, the opportunity to, to be at the same place and, uh, and speak. And also we give the opportunity uh, to have a piece in the, um, in the depository of knowledge uh, completing the image that we have uh, uh, from scientific uh, publication with uh, information that was not easy to find in English. Of course, high in the agenda, there are licenses, quantities, amateur and professional pickers and lists. And in this we had uh, uh, learned a lot uh, from uh, our colleagues in Europe and especially from uh, Spain, from the system they use in Castilla y León. And also high in the agenda, there are um, issues that have to do with biodiversity and protection. And so far, eight, eight species are uh, proposed to be protected in Greece. And the scheme that is uh, proposed for a management um, uh, has as a center a national management body and goes back to the local uh, forestry services. Uh, one, one reason, extra reason for that is that uh, most, almost all, we could say, a uh, forest in Greece belong to the state. And of course, traceability is in the agenda and certification to promote mushrooms as local, wild, healthy and natural foods. Uh, also, we organize uh, science to practice events locally in Ioannina, where uh, we are located. Um, promoting initiatives that uh, are not known even in Greece, like the, the Greek uh, truffle trees, or organizing uh, seminars uh, on mushroom recognition for forest uh, officers uh, from the of the local forestry service. And um, because uh, Greece, I think in all Europe, because of the pandemic, in all the world, the things uh, goes a little bit slower than before. 
Uh, we had the contact with the, the Ministry of Environment last week, and um, they confirmed that it is in their priorities to continue this work and to implement it. Um, and first of all, research, management, marketing, according to the aims of the National Forestry Strategy, same as for uh, aromatic and medicinal plants, and with possible funding from the Green Fund. Thank you very much from our uh, incredible team and our incredible INET uh, that we worked together for all these years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Calliope, for a wonderful presentation. I think all five speakers, including you, you managed to just respect the, the time that you were given, which is which is wonderful. And I know that it was a challenge and that you all of you had to prepare for that. I hope, ladies and gentlemen, that you you in this way you at least got some kind of flavor of each of these five innovation networks. So this was a way of introducing them, if you like, but also giving the opportunity to the speakers to at least select a couple of highlights to depict the huge amount of work that has been done in each of these uh, five uh, innovation networks. Now, um, I know that there have been a couple of questions with respect to can we have the links to, for instance, the, uh, the presentations or the documents that have been mentioned before, like this manifesto or this white paper, etc. Can we get how can we get in touch with uh, some of these networks, etc. So there are lots of questions like this. My suggestion would be, especially looking at the time, we have to proceed. And I think that the nature of these questions can uh, are perfect to be addressed uh, in, in the chat. So I would like to invite all speakers, also of these islands, uh, to regularly check the chat and see if there are any questions that might be relevant for you or that you could help address. Okay, so well, ladies and gentlemen, we have to move to our next big part of this uh, first session of our final conference. But before doing so, and just as a kind of a small bridge, let us look at another of these animated infographics. This time it is going to be an infographic about Cork. Alberto, you can launch the infographic.
So here we're back, ladies and gentlemen. So this was another of these animated infographics. And we have one of these for each of the innovation networks. And you will see uh, all of them throughout this conference. Now let's move on with the next part on our agenda. And that is a round table and debate on a very important topic. It is about two watts, two watts a non wood first product circuitry for the Mediterranean area. This is going to be a round table. So I will have a couple of guests on my table, and I would like to first introduce them, and then we start uh, the questions and the debate, right? So let me first uh, introduce the first uh, guest on my table, that is Mr. Vladimir Nikolic. He's the Ministry or a Senior Advisor at the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Water Management in Serbia. Welcome to our table. I'm very glad to, to see you again. We, uh, happened to meet each other during the uh, policy forum, and I'm happy that you were uh, willing to take up uh, our invitation to being uh, with us again. So happy to meet you. Welcome. Now, the next speaker we're going to have is Mr. Antonio Gonçalves Ferreira, uh, and he is the head, uh, he is the president of UNAC, and he will be representing the Cork Oak and Cork Observatory, which is going to be very relevant for our discussion. Welcome mm -hmm. to our table. Mr. Ferreira. Uh, the third speaker we have, or the third guest on our table, is Mr. Hamed Ali Hassan. He's the Director General of the National Agriculture Observatory in Tunisia. Welcome to our table, Mr. Thank you, uh, Ali. And then, finally, we have Clemens uh, Schadauer. He's the coordinator of ENFIN, the European National Forest Inventory Network. Happy to uh, invite you and to have you on our table, Mr. Shadow. So let us start the debate. And maybe let's raise the first question. This panel debate really is about this idea of creating this non-wood forest product observatory, not in a specific country, but for a larger area, the Mediterranean area. And obviously, if you mention the word, or if you say the word observatory, it's very clear that it is somehow about collecting the data on non-wood forest products. So from your perspective, as a senior advisor of the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Water Management of Serbia, I think you're at the center of policy making, at monitoring the effect of policies, etc., etc. So what what this mean to you? Would you be interested in having such uh, an observatory? And if, if so, why? Could you briefly state so, Mr. Nikolic? Um, good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for the invitation to, to speak on this panel. Um, yes, of course, as uh, someone who is, who is, let's say, representing the, the ministry, which is in charge for the, the forestry uh, management in, in Serbia, we are for sure interested. Uh, as I mentioned it in, in this uh, debate that we have at, at the policy forum, unfortunately, the, the uh, part or the, the let's say the subject of non-wood forest products is somehow in Serbia shifted from the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Water Management to the Ministry of Environment. And Ministry of Environment is dealing with, with the, uh, let's say, uh, permits, with the quantities, uh, with the issuing the, the licenses for picking, for export, etc. Uh, we as a forestry sector are for sure interested in, in uh, such a, a topic. And we would really be happy to, let's say, to, to find out uh, and to know what is really existing in, in, in our forests. Uh, as I mentioned, it's now in, in the hands of the Ministry of Environment and uh, the revenues uh, goes somehow to the Ministry of Environment, so not to the forestry sector. But uh, yes, we are interested in such kind of, of, of observatory, so to find out um, what are, let's say, the, the aspects of non-wood forest products in, in Serbia? Excellent. So, well, at the, from, from the policy perspective, it is very clear there is an interest in such observatory because you need data for basically evidence-based policy making, for evidence-based decision making. You need the data, right? So that is clear. So there is a need uh, at, at least from the perspective of the policy makers. Now, let us see. There is a need, but what is on offer? And to answer that question, there are a couple of, of uh, examples we would like to introduce to you. And the first is perhaps uh, Antonio uh, Ferreira. Um, 
Because we have this Cork Observatory and Cork Oak Observatory in Portugal, right? So can you elaborate a little bit? This is a beautiful example of an existing observatory related to a specific product, Cork. So could you explain us a little bit about this observatory? What is it? What type of data do you collect in this observatory? Mr. Mr. Ferreira? Okay, good morning to everyone. Um, I'm very glad to be here to share our experience. Uh, we run the, the observatory uh, for some time now, since uh, uh, 2008, um, on Cork. And recently we have uh, another insight also on the pine cone uh, market. Um, the observatory uh, tries to, to, to see what the market, how the market works. Uh, and get information from it, uh, because uh, in the past we, we relied on the on data from the the Portuguese governmental services, uh, but then they they have uh, that that services are not working anymore uh, on that area, and we have to build our own our own data collecting um, effort. Uh, the the um, Firstly, we made it uh, made it voluntarily. Uh, our producers, uh, we asked them to give us the information, uh, and then we change uh, to an inquiry that we made uh, that we make uh, annually. Um, that is made by the branches of our uh, our regional branches spread over the country. Um, that has worked very well we gain trust and confidence from the from the producers they started to see that the 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 feedback that they get in information was very uh, very important uh, and we have advanced we have step by step um, we ha we had not focused on short term results uh, and things had grown very well Nowadays, uh, we, we have a very reliable source of information. Uh, we survey something like 15 to 20 percent of the Portu total Portuguese cork production, uh, and that's that's very uh, that's a sample, a very representative sample, and we can say that our data is very is very strong. Uh, on the on the, um, the pine cone uh, side, uh, we are sta we started in 2016. Uh, we are growing. It's a more difficult uh, um, uh, market, as Sven said. Uh, there's a lot of uh, non non um, I don't know the, the right word uh, non economic production um, production that is outside the rules uh, so it's very difficult to survey that uh, but it's important to know that what is off road and what, who goes on the road um, but we are we are growing and uh, we are starting we are trying to to use now uh, some online uh, inquiry uh, that is more um, easy to it's not as feasible as um, as strong in quality but uh, but uh, more people go there and answer so it's another we are we are using the, the the both tools and try to to see uh, if we if we can um, use more the the online surveys in the future. Um, import uh, quality information is always very important. Uh, in Cork, that's more important uh, even because um, w s m most of the producers only extract cork every nine years. So they are very far away from what's the market uh, information. So okay. that's a, an easy, uh, an easy um, uh, way to uh, give information and to get information. And it's as important to build a very strong information collecting network as it is important to have a very strong divulgation network. Uh, so that's the two main uh, issues that can make an observatory or um, a market outlook uh, important 
for who has to um, read and deal with the data and to has to who has to um, who can have the information and can uh, take something out of the information. Yeah, thank you so much for this statement, uh, Mr. Ferrar. It's already clear we have this beautiful example of Portugal, but you're already pointing to the fact that, yes, it, it's, uh, there's a lot going on. It is still growing. You need the quality of the data, etc. It takes quite some effort. Well, I would like to, to, to introduce the speaker, and I was, uh, I'm so ashamed that I forgot to introduce Mr. Adriano Radi, because he's a very important guest at our table. He's the head of bioeconomy and governance program at CTFC, and in his capacity here, in this uh, discussion at the round table, he's here to basically represent the Catalan Forest Observatory uh, in Spain. Mr. Ali, my apologies for forgetting about you. There was just too much going on. I hope you understand. Now, that being said, I would like to, to give the word to you because the Catalan Forest Observatory, it constitutes another beautiful example of an observatory related to forestry. Right. So tell us a little bit about this observatory. What is it? What type of data does it collect? Can you explain this to us, please? Yes, thank you, Stephen. Uh, well, really, there is a radical change uh, maybe five or six years ago, because before the Catalan Forest Observatory was, I mean, uh, something as a statistical. I mean, a lot of information we gather, but not in a dynamic way, in a theoretic way. And so the first questions that we put on the table was around uh, which kind of information we need in order to improve the decision-making process. And as economists, uh, uh, my concern was focused on basically and uh, price and the quantity in order to improve uh, the, our knowledge about market and production productions. Uh, so really, and. I only try to focus uh, on uh, wild forest products, but there is a lot of more information that you can find in our observatory. Uh, regarding wild forest products, you can find the uh, price and quantity uh, of cork, uh, mushroom, uh, truffles, uh, pine nuts and pine cones, and uh, honey and uh, aromatic and medicinal plants. No, uh, because we consider that uh, was an important bet in order to improve our surgery. And really, the, the response uh, confirm our uh, choice, our decisions. Because in the five years, uh, the visits on our surgery uh, jumped from um, 15,000 to 40,000 uh, per year. And also, for example, our followers on Twitter are doubled from 1,500 uh, to 3,000. So, uh, and it's interesting because uh, one of the most um, uh, interesting uh, category is the price of truffles. That you know that uh, Spain and France are very important markets in, uh, in Europe. So, so that was the, 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 our uh, beginning idea. And uh, we are glad that the public appreciates uh, the data that we have facilitated. That's, us, of course, uh, mainly based on Catalan data, but we try to offer also comparison, for example, regarding cork with Portuguese prices or regarding uh, truffle with French prices. Excellent. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, Radi, for introducing this Catalan Observatory. So we have now the example of uh, an observatory in, in, in uh, Portugal, focusing predominantly on pork. We have now had this example in, uh, of the Catalan Observatory, uh, following several products, basically, uh, focusing, as he mentioned, rather on the Catalan uh, market, uh, but interested in trying to follow additional trends, which brings us already to the level of this Mediterranean uh, uh, kind of uh, observatory. But before bringing the discussion to a more international level, let us consider a third case. And we have uh, Hamid Ali with us, and he is basically representing this National Agriculture Observatory in Tunisia. So that is a third example of a national observatory. And let's take a closer look at this. So, uh, Hamid, could you introduce us or explain a little bit more about uh, your case, basically, the case in Tunisia? Thank you, Stephen, and uh, I'm glad to be here with you in the, this final conference. Uh, only to say that uh, the, uh, 
National Ag uh, Observatory of Agriculture is uh, uh, concern all agriculture and forest products. So, uh, as you know, agriculture economy is m more uh, important, and uh, so we we have uh, some information, data, and information about uh, forest products and uh, non-wood forest products. So uh, here at uh, the National uh, Observatory of Agriculture, we are interested on uh, prices, on uh, trade market, on uh, investment, and uh, uh, all information related to, uh, f to production, agriculture, and forest production. So the main uh, aim of this work is uh, decision making how to help investors uh, and uh, traders etc to take profit of this information uh, through uh, market regulation for example for the decision makers for uh, opportunity for investment uh, for uh, farmers etc and uh, some information concern forestry. So let's uh, now speak about uh, forest products. Uh, here we have, uh, we follow data and information about uh, forest products market. And uh, the idea and the, the here is uh, to increase trans transparency uh, this uh, this is, is very uh, very important when the information is uh, very scarce, especially for non wood forest products. Uh, so, uh, as uh, it was said uh, previously, the problem of non wood forest products are uh, that they are undervalued, and uh, there is uh, illegal uh, trade and the black market. So uh, when we increase tra transparency, we uh, we reduce this uh, this illegal trade. Uh, and the other uh, main problem for Tunisia is uh, the uh, how to uh, to have the good prices for for coke and other products. As uh, uh, don't uh, here is the the problem is. Uh, the, we organize auction, but we in this auction uh, we have a very uh, small uh, buyers uh, number of buyers, and we we need to develop uh, data and information at, uh, at the regional level, not only at national level, because we need to know the prices in uh, Portugal, in Spain, and, and uh, in other countries in order to, uh, to uh, regulate our prices and our uh, market. So, uh, and for that, the idea of uh, a Mediterranean observatory is very important. Uh, so we, you can see and uh, you can find in our uh, website uh, on agri.tn or uh, an uh, open data website, uh, agridata.tn, many information, many data and, and uh, information about uh, non wood forest products in Tunisia. Uh, so, cork, uh, 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 aromatic plants, etc. So, all this information are uh, uh, open for public. And thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, um, Mr. Dali, for introducing this Tunisian example of, of the network of the, the observatory. I, I think the three of you basically are referring to the importance of enhancing trans, uh, transparency um, throughout or in this market because it's uh, there's a lot of, of market data available, but not so much uh, in on, on agriculture. I mean, but probably a bit less on non-wood forest products. So it has its own challenges, this sector, right? Uh, you also pointed out, uh, Mr. Dali, that it's not only about decision-making for policymakers, obviously, but also, like you mentioned, for investors, for the farmers themselves, right? So it is important to have this data as it is. It's not only about transparency, it's also about giving a boost to this sector, 
right? So, well, the three of you made very clear statements. So we have these bits of, of information and observatories created, if you like, at the national level. Now, if we have this dream of creating something at a larger scale, this Mediterranean uh, level, then maybe it's good to take a closer look at some examples of, of basically networks that have been created at a larger level. And we have feeders, Clemens and Shadower from ENFIN. So that is the European National Forest Inventory Network. So, well, Mr. Shadow, could you explain a bit? What is this ENFIN? What is the network? What does it do? And what is your experience then on, on accumulating this data at a scale that is larger than the national scale? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not so sure whether I can, uh, can, can you see me? Yes, yes, we see Okay, you. okay, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you also for the invitation to this round table. Uh, I'm happy to share my experiences with you, of course. I'm coming a little bit from outside, not from outside the forest, but from, from, from uh, the National Forest Inventories. Uh, maybe I should explain it very shortly, something a little bit different than your topic is, uh, although it could be included in our activities. We are the ones that go to the forest and measure everything and put, put together a lot, a lot of data. This is done in very many countries of Europe. Uh, so our network covers 29 countries, European countries. So that's quite large. Uh, it also covers more or less uh, the European part of the Mediterranean area. So I know a little bit what I'm talking about if, if, if we uh, think about such network activities on a larger scale. Yeah, uh, what, 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 what we tried to do during the last 18 years, first of all, we tried to, to, to um, uh, promote our activities. This is something which is very important and which is something which is not so easy on the European scale. Uh, but uh, actually, we have uh, a European community for this. And, and, and that's good for us because otherwise we could not exist uh, so we have customers which are sitting more or less in Brussels, actually, or maybe the EA. So it's it's a it's it's everything. It's it's about some European institutions, and they need us actually. And I guess uh, this initiative is also needed. So there is no question about that. There is a need, but on the other hand, uh, if you want to form such an observatory, you have to think if you really have to share something. I guess you do have to share something. This could be uh, methodology, this could be data, this could also be knowledge gaps, which is from my point of view by far more important than, 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 than everything else. Uh, you, you should always share the gaps and not, not only the knowledge. Um, uh, so, uh, and with what, what is also important is that you find some common policy when it comes to data and when it comes to information. So this would be just my first input, maybe. Excellent. Well, you, you are already pointing towards a number of uh, possible actions. I think let's just use the remaining time to indeed discuss, well, we all realized the potential importance, a huge importance, basically, of having such an observatory at this Mediterranean scale, right? So if we have actions, if there are things that we can do to basically promote this ID, not only the ID, but also support the creation of this Mediterranean observatory, indeed referring to this sharing and taking into account that, uh, I think it's a very good indication that you already give uh, Mr. Shadow, so to, to, to share something, either methodology or data or the gaps, the knowledge gaps as well, uh, or a common policy. So these are already four very clear indications. What else do we believe needs to be done? And this is just an open debate now, so any of you can take uh, the word. Okay. Uh, I think this uh, this observatory could be the um, the next step of this incredible project. On this incredible project, we strengthen our links, our networks, and this is this could be something that uh, that remains for the future from this project. Um, 
we are very different between countries in between regions, but we have a common link that is the Mediterranean. Uh, and that's a very strong uh, identity and uh, a very strong community. So, uh, and we have very common interests, common problems, and the, a common difficulty to to share that experience. I think so. It would it should be it would be very interesting to have uh, to give this step further and uh, uh, and um, and build something for the future. Uh, I don't think we need to build something new, a new house. Uh, we we already have uh, we have FE uh, FE Med. Uh, it's it's a very nice idea from the past that we we should strengthen, and um, we have to do what we have done in this project: uh, trust in each other, uh, go step by step, uh, and focus on long term results. Um, and we have done it over the last uh, three years. So we just have to, to keep, keep, keep doing it. Okay. okay. Uh, we, we are very interested. We, we would like to, to participate and we and share our experience and our data that is free and uh, open source to, to everyone. Excellent. So you're already pointing to basically giving leverage to this, this networks that we have created, this cooperation, this, this efforts that have by, by joining basically the forces, uh, the, the things that we achieve by joining forces as a kind of a, a logic sequence, we could create this, this uh, observatory. Okay, that's a, that's a very nice uh, suggestion. If, if I now turn to the policy side again from things, what would you believe would need to be done, Mr. Nikolic, in order to create such an observatory? Yes, and I, I would agree with Mr. Ferreira. So we, we need to join forces, and and uh, what Mr. Shadar said. So to let's say create at the very beginning and on share as well. So the methodologies for for data collection to to share the different uh, views or the joint views on on this, and then to let's say to step uh, to go one step further and to to create something which will be. Uh, jointly managed by by all or let's say uh, all sides. Um, what we are really interested in uh, it's that someone who is dealing with, with the policy and then the policy making uh, is that we need a different sets of data for for different purposes. So as well for the, the setting up the policy framework for setting up the, the let's say the subsidy system, the, the quotas, etc. So if you want to do a, a good decision making, so you need to have the, the data. So starting from the species, starting from the, the quantities, uh, prices, uh, etc. And this is, this is something what, what we are really missing today. So um, my view is that it will be an excellent thing to have all of this and at one place. So, and especially if we use the, the common methodology for, for it. Okay, so basically what you're stating is that indeed using, as there are different use cases for the data, it also means that apart from the methodology, the data, the knowledge gaps, the common policy, we need to somehow agree on the scope. What is the type of information we're going to collect probably with uh, quality criteria associated with this. That's, uh, but it's very good to hear that also from a policy making point of view, uh, the relevance is recognized and that there is a willingness to be part of this building, this observatory. Mr. Ratti, could I ask for your opinion on what do you think would be the next step if we want to create this, this uh, Mediterranean observatory? Well, <clears throat> according to our point of view, because you know, we act in an open market and so uh, it's very interesting in order some one of my colleagues mentioned before the transparency. No? So, okay, I can monitor the situation of travel of Corco once you want in Catalonia or in Spain, but what happened in France or in Portugal? And that is an interesting uh, question because, of course, most of the travel production, for example, is exported from Catalonia to France. Or, for example, Cork uh, going from uh, Catalonia to Portugal. So it's a very interesting uh, and basic uh, uh, point of view to know if 
our market situation is comparable or not with um, the, the final buyer or the most important market that surrounded uh, our uh, territories. No? And so that's, I think, the first goal that we can achieve with an uh, European uh, or Mediterranean area uh, for this observatory. And second, in order to do that, it's important, for example, to try on standardizations. Because, for example, that I follow a uh, price in Portugal, if I'm not wrong, the, 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 the GPPP, the Gabinet de Planeamiento Políticas de Administración General in Portugal, uh, um, put the prices uh, referred to Arroba, that is a very common unit of measure there, but is a bit difficult to understand outside. No? Or, for example, talking about Spain, and uh, we detected in the past um, confusion about price of pine nut on pine cone. Uh, some statistical report referred uh, uh, to cone and other one to nuts. And of course, finally, the data is not uh, reliable. And so I think that we can do an effort in order to um, harmonize uh, use of measures and standards in order that information is comparable. And that's the third and the last consideration that um, I put on the table that unfortunately for administration, statistics are on the bottom of the pyramid of importance. No? And so uh, there is uh, low attention, um, but uh, it's very difficult to understand how do you make decisions uh, from a political point of view, industrial or first order, what you want, if we don't have a real, reliable uh, statistical basis. And so I think that was a strategical point uh, to improve a collaboration in uh, this way, in these directions. And of course, we need will, uh, we need uh, resources, and uh, we need the collaborations uh, between different entities. Excellent. Thank you so much. So what about you, Mr. Dali? What do you think would be the next step? What needs to happen from your perspective? And knowing the Tunisian situation, but yeah. you're also quite familiar with the European situation. So yeah. how do you feel about this? Yes. I think the, the next step is uh, firstly to know how, where to uh, host this observatory. And I, uh, I agree with, with you that uh, the EFIMED can be the the host of this observatory. Uh, just uh, also to say that uh, there was a, a thought about the forest week, the next forest week at the Mediterranean level uh, in Tunisia. And I, uh, uh, give it, I gave this initiative to create an observatory of Mediterranean forest to uh, FAO, Silva Mediterranea, and uh, they were interested by this idea, and they already developed uh, a concept note about that. So uh, we need uh, also to to sh share this information between uh, FAO Silva Mediterranea and EFIMED to uh, work together about that. And uh, for, for, for working about observatory, first of all, uh, techni at the technical level, we, we should have a, a common methodology and we should share information between, uh, between different uh, partners. So I think there is a, a will, uh, willingness to to work together on that and I, I, I uh, and already there are many information many data and information uh, that already exists uh, uh, in uh, different countries and different uh, websites etc and uh, I think if we uh, we organize that uh, it will be easy at short term to to have uh, at least a first phase of this observatory. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it is very clear that the, all of you basically, be it the policy making side or the three existing uh, observatories, all of you are quite explicit that you want to go in that direction, that you are willing 
to, to start this process of, of, of sharing that you want to contribute to create to creating basically this uh, Mediterranean uh, observatory. And there are some clear indications on what could be the potential uh, next steps. But maybe because I'm looking at the time and I'm afraid we, we have to slowly come to a conclusion, even if it would be a fascinating topic to continue to talk. But I would like to give the final word on this uh, roundtable to Mr. Shadower. Now, you, you've witnessed and heard the statements, there is a willingness. You were very clear on what you believe needs to be done, uh, starting with the sharing, etc. even if that means also going towards the standardization, etc. as we understood. Now, in view of your experience, and considering you, your experience at, at setting up such a structure or uh, initiative at the European level, what would be your advice to make sure that we can indeed bring this to a good end, and would you be willing to support this uh, initiative? Yes, thank you. Of course, I would be willing to support as it fits to national forest inventory work. That's clear from my point of view. Maybe uh, coming coming to uh, the last 18 years, what was always at the top level, the discussion about standardization and harmonization. What is more important? Is it the top down, standardize everything, lose your time series and so on, or do it bottom up? harmonization, uh, which is maybe the better way of working. And what is also very important from my point of view uh, to think from the very beginning is you're putting together data. Who will put together the information? Who is it? You have to be sure to have a clear structure. Who will get, produce information from the data. Uh, you, you have to settle down something uh, like a, the common understanding where you also include this issue because otherwise it's not so easy uh, that you stay for a long time together. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm looking at the chat and at the time. I see that we're running behind schedule now, so I need to respect what we stated before. Uh, I would just like to say that there is... Um, um, yes, I see a message that Inacio would like to make a statement. I see there is a question from Jenny. I suggest that this question will be taken up in the chat. But well, let's let's go for to, to Inacio for a statement he wants to make, uh, and then give the word to Margarita as uh, to come to closure. But I would first of all like to thank uh, my dear guests at the table. My apologies once more, Mr. Adi, for. Uh, Overlooking at the beginning, it was just like I mentioned, too many screens open and then we don't see any screen anymore. You understand, mm -hmm. I hope. Right? But thank you, all of you, for willing to share your expertise and your experience and your insights on the, this topic. I think it was a very interesting discussion, so well done. Uh, Inacio, you, would, you wanted to state uh, something. No, yes, thank you. I want to take the time only one minute only. Thank you very much for all the um, fantastic contribution this morning. Also for the direct uh, mentions to EFIMED as playing a key role in developing this observatory. Uh, we are in fact in contact with the Mediterranean Committee, discussing together how to activate the existing initiatives and working groups. And for sure, we will place this observatory to see how we can finance and how we can make synergies and connect with the existing ones, give them visibility and strength, not, not replacing anything, just building on, on that and, and and creating a greater impact. So, so thank you for the trust and thank you for the, for the commitment. Good. Thank you. Now, uh, Margarita, it's on to you now to make a statement. Okay. Just, just to close this session, I thank all the the speakers, the participants in the roundtable, and also all the participants uh, in the session. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Even me that are aware of the uh, achievements of the incredible po project, when I saw all the presentations as a whole set, I was quite impressed with what we have achieved. But I just have a message. Incredible is finished, but uh, we should not stop here. We have created the networks. We have identified the challenges. Let's go on working together and try to solve them. That's my last message. Okay. See you in the afternoon. Excellent. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the first session of our final minutes. Uh, we will be back at three o'clock for the second session, and we hope to see you again. We hope that you will return to us. Thank you so much. Bye for now. <laughs>